Good evening. Thank you very much for tuning in to our third debate of term. Um, liberalism has provided the hegemonic framework for understanding politics in Western Europe and the United States since the end of the Second World War. In 1992, following the collapse of the Soviet Union, Francis Fukuyama proclaimed the end of history as we know it in the form of the universalization of liberal democracy across the globe. Yet, in the wake of the financial crash, Brexit and the Trump administration, this hegemony has come under attack and many on all sides of the political spectrum are now questioning its core principles. Has liberalism let us down? Is it dying? Is it doomed to failure? These are the questions we will be discussing tonight with the motion before us, this house believes liberalism has failed us. Um, on this call tonight, we have four eminent guest speakers and two student speakers who will be debating the topic. Uh, there is also the opportunity for you as an audience to submit any questions or raise points of information in response to speeches you hear tonight. So please do follow the link below um, and ask as many um, as you have. Um, please remember, we will also be voting at the end of tonight's debate. The poll uh, is in the link below uh, and you can take this as an opportunity to decide uh, whether you agree with the motion, despise it, or for whatever nuanced reason, feel the need to abstain. Now, without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker for the proposition tonight, uh, Nick Timothy. Uh, Nick is the author of Renaming Our Nation, The Future for Conservatism, and the former Joint Chief of Chaff staff to Theresa May while she, was shadowed, while she was Prime Minister. Prior to that, Nick was Mrs May's special advisor in the Home Office and the director of the New Schools Network from 2015 to 2017. Nick, you have our ears. Uh, thank you very much. I think I'm contractually obliged to say I'm also a Daily Telegraph columnist, uh, otherwise I get told off by my editor. Um, I'm charged with making the case that uh, liberalism has failed us, but I, I want to start by defending it. Uh, because my proposition tonight is that while liberalism is indeed failing us, it actually needs to be saved from itself. The problems we face today, inequality and unbalanced economy, entrenched disadvantage, diminished trust, declining institutions, growing social divisions, awful political discourse, are not caused by essential liberalism. By that I mean the non-ideological liberalism synonymous with pluralism and our democratic way of life. Only extremists make that claim because this essential liberalism is what makes liberal democracy function. It requires elections to determine who govern us, checks and balances to protect minorities from the tyranny of the majority. It demands good behavioural norms, including a willingness to accept election and referendum results. And it requires support, qualified support that is, for free markets. Essential liberalism doesn't uh, provide a general theory of rights or justice, an ideological framework that leads towards the harmonisation of values and interests or a single philosophical truth. It understands that human values and interests are often in conflict and it therefore respects political diversity. And that is why it must be defended. But this is very different to the manifestations of ideological liberalism we often see today. Of course, there are many factors behind the problems and crises we face. But one common factor is policy, political choices made by politicians. And that policy is shaped often unconsciously by philosophical assumptions. More often than not, the different forms of ideological ultra-liberalism that go beyond and indeed attack the essential liberalism that most of us say we believe in. Of course, there is no single ultra-liberal agenda. There's an elite liberalism shared by most members of the governing classes and inst elite institutions, but not necessarily the wider public. This can stand for policies like mass immigration, a lightly regulated labor market, and support for supranational government of different kinds. But we also have what I call an ultra-liberal ratchet, beliefs that aren't shared across the party divide, but which keep propelling liberalism forward. So on the right, market reformers think mainly of the economy, while left liberals pursue their agenda of cultural liberalism and militant identity politics. One side might attempt to reverse some changes made by the other, but most remain. And market reformers and left liberals end up reinforcing one another. They leave us with economic dislocation, social atomization, and perversely for many of them on the right, a bigger state left trying to pick up the pieces. And the trouble with all these forms of ultra-liberalism is that they're based on a conception of humanity that isn't real. 
liberal thought is built on the false premise that there are not only universal values, but also natural and universal rights. The flaws of the state of nature theories mean that liberalism from the start has had several features hardwired into it. Citizens are autonomous and rational individuals, their consent to liberal government is assumed, and rights are natural and universal. This explains why for many liberals, uh, the historical and cultural context of government is irrelevant. Institutions that, and traditions that impose obligations on us can be cast off. All that matters as far as government is concerned is the freedom of the individual and the preservation of their property. We can be given legal rights without corresponding responsibilities. Duties to others are often simply unfair hindrances. For many liberals, freedom, more than justice, equality, security or anything else, is the overriding and most important value. Liberals like John Stuart Mill sometimes argued that pluralism and tolerance are worthwhile because the trial and error they make possible leads to truth and an increasingly perfect society. It's this line of argument, this fallacy, this assumption that your beliefs stand for progress that can lead liberalism towards illiberalism. It's intolerance of supposedly backward opinions, norms and institutions can quickly become intolerance of those who remain loyal to traditional ways of life. And this illiberalism is a particular problem on the ultra liberal left. Uh, here, left liberals have been influenced by thinkers actually outside the liberal tradition. Postmodernists like Foucault and the mainly American thinkers behind the rise of identity politics. But instead of confronting this illiberal thinking, many have compromised with it and sometimes even embraced it with enthusiasm. Discourse, so many left liberals believe, is oppressive. People aren't in charge of their destinies. Their social reality is imposed on them through language and customs and institutions. And even the victims of the powerful participate in their own oppression through their own language, stories and assumed social roles. Left liberals don't just want to remove the hierarchy, but penalise those who they, who they believe subjugate others. Uh, equal political rights are therefore not enough. Uh, as President Biden said in his inaugural speech, equity, not individual equality, is the goal. We'll be hearing a lot more about equity in the future. Uh, and the resulting policies are unavoidably illiberal and discriminatory. So because historically power lay with white men, today whiteness and masculinity can be attacked because we don't understand how our social roles are constructed. We don't understand the meaning sometimes even of our own words. Those who hear us, particularly if they're members of marginalized groups, understand better than we do the true meaning of what we say and write. Because discourse is a form of violence, free speech is no longer sacrosanct, and it's legitimate to meet violent language with violent direct action. Now, I might be a conservative, but I'm not here only to criticize the left. Uh, because on the right, uh, support for the free market can sometimes turn into something more extreme. Struggling communities shorn of social capital, lacking infrastructure and with few opportunities for few, few young people are often ignored in the belief that the invisible hand of the market will come to the rescue. Instead, policy energy is devoted to deregulating the labor market and marketizing public goods. Economic liberals are right to condemn the planned socialist economy, which has a habit of ending in failure, shortages and corruption. But they're wrong to assume that completely unregulated markets are efficient, or for those who do make this claim, fair. Sellers and buyers often lack the information they need to price a product. They might not understand its complexity, like the city traders who caused the financial crash didn't understand the worthlessness of the bundles of subprime mortgages they were buying. Businesses might not understand or care about the negative externalities of their trading. Companies might exploit the absence of competition to drive up their prices or drive down the prices of their suppliers unfairly. And with international trade uh, in particular, a market value might not take into account subsidies and state support. And of course, the ideological problem is about services as well as markets. Hayek, a hero to many on the right, said no political system, not even a democratic one, nor even a small and local one, can accurately reflect collective choice in the way that a market does. So for his supporters, it follows that the NHS can't be the right way of delivering healthcare since consumer choices and real pricing don't drive decision making. But the whole point of the NHS is that it was designed not to follow the relentless 
ultra-liberal logic of individual freedom and consumer choice, but other values of equality, solidarity, and fairness. If what I say doesn't sound very conservative to you, uh, and I accept it might not, uh, I invite you to consider the differences between ideological liberalism and true conservatism. And remember, Hayek was a liberal. In fact, he wrote a postscript to the Constitution of Liberty, Margaret Thatcher's favourite book, and called it Why I'm Not a Conservative. Well, I'm not a liberal, not an ideological one anyway, which is why I put it to you that there's more to life than the market, more to society than individuals, more to our future than the destru destruction of cultures and nations. And when liberals accept these truths as self-evident, liberalism might stop failing us and might start once more serving us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nick, for your uh, speech. Um, may I encourage uh, anybody listening, uh, if you'd like to uh, question any of the points raised, you can uh, do so by uh, following the link below uh, to our form. Uh, we will now uh, proceed uh, to hear from the first speaker for side opposition. Uh, our force, uh, fir fir first speaker is uh, Professor Anthony uh, Clifford Grayling. Professor Grayling is a philosopher uh, and the founder and master of the New College of Humanities and a supernumerary fellow of St Anne's College, Oxford. He has written and edited over 30 books on philosophy and other subjects, including The Good Book, The God Argument and Democracy and Its Critics. Professor Grayling also wins the competition for the best dressed male speaker tonight. Professor Grayling, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I do feel a little overdressed in this company, I have to say. Uh, well, I oppose the um, motion in the sense that I don't think that liberalism is failing us. On the contrary, I think very core, essential liberal values are precisely supporting us through a rather difficult and uh, challenging time. Uh, Nick rather uh, eloquently characterized some of those essential liberal values. Uh, I want to gloss them slightly in a, in a different way, because of course there is this snowstorm of prefixes and suffixes and adjectives, classical liberalism and neoliberalism and the rest, which tend to obscure something very simple indeed about what is fundamental to the liberal outlook. I'm tempted almost to, to um, use a prefixed version of liberalism, so-called paleoliberalism, to d differentiate it from neoliberalism, which can be, I think, caricatured best by saying that it is in fact nothing to do with liberalism, but as a form of uh, libertarianism, uh, which in the ideal for a fully paid up libertarian would be one in which society is a bit like Hobbes's jungle, uh, unrestricted markets and unrestrained greed. But liberalism is a very different animal. And the very simple characterization that one can give of it is to say that it consists in a commitment to what we think of as civil liberties and human rights. That is absolutely the core of the outlook. The idea of the autonomy of the individual, the privacy required by individuals in order to be self-creating and, and to flourish. The idea that we can have access to protections and remedies at law and a due process of law. And the idea that we should protect fundamental freedoms, freedoms of expression, freedoms of assembly. The fact that we can participate in decision making about how we're governed and how our lives are shaped. These are central liberal values. They include also, of course, the idea that we should uh, allow other people, allow other individuals in our communities to flourish also in ways that seem best to them, under always the uh, government of the principle that what uh, any one individual does shouldn't constrain other individuals in the search for lives that are good and flourishing for themselves. Now, these are vague generalities, of course, but they provide a, a, a kind of framework or matrix within which this constant negotiation that a society has with itself about how individual lives should best be left uh, to develop and how society itself should uh, navigate the um, relationships that thus result. And that turns on a recognition, something that uh, a fundamental liberal outlook sees and uh, respects. And that is two facts about human beings. The first being that uh, human individuals do need those spaces around themselves so that they can 
find a way to live and to develop themselves and, and to flourish. And this is what is meant by talk of autonomy and uh, privacy. But it also recognizes the fact that we are social beings. We need our relationships with one another. We need to be uh, implanted in a community uh, and to have good relationships. Now, these two facts about us stand in some degree of tension. I mean, on the one hand, of course, individuals need society and, and what membership of society provides in the way of resources and material aid. But it's also the case that societies need individuals. They need the creativity and energy and commitment of individuals so that they can, they can happen, they can exist and develop. But individuals can sometimes need to be protected from society and societies, or at any rate, the networks of relationships that constitute society need to be protected from malign individuals. And, and that's why I say it's a, a kind of continual negotiation, a seeking for balance. And these generalities, which we sum up when we talk about civil liberties and, and, and human rights, provide us with the, the, the kind of, of, of handrails um, for the paths along which we progress uh, as we conduct those negotiations. Think of the alternatives. If we didn't live in societies which respected these very fundamental liberal values, what kind of society would we occupy? Would it be a society in which individuals are not protected against the depredations of people who are greedy or more vigorous or already better equipped than they? Would we want to live in societies which are in, in effect social or for that matter, political governmental tyrannies? Um, it's almost certainly the case, of course, that um, oligarchies uh, of people do distort the way that uh, societies operate now. Um, hidden plutocracies perhaps have an overweening influence on the way that government works, let's say. But in a liberal dispensation, it becomes possible to push back against those things. Think, for example, about the fact that uh, racism and sexism, other distorting and oppressive features of contemporary societies, or indeed of societies throughout history, only in the era of liberal dispensations has it been possible for people to stand up and argue back and try to remedy some of the harms that are caused by these sorts of isms. Now, if we look at what's been happening in some of the uh, putatively advanced liberal democracies of the world in the last four or five years, look at the United States of America under Trump, or look at Brexit Britain, facing a lot of stresses and, and challenges. In the case of Trump, uh, an assault on the Constitution there, an attempt to exclude uh, um, people coming to the United States uh, seeking opportunities, bringing their energies and, and uh, creative outlooks with them, building a wall as if a wall ever stopped anybody coming in or going out anywhere in history. Um, th these endeavors by, by Trump, very damaging in themselves, were nevertheless resisted by a robust society. The courts were able to limit some of the things that Trump wanted to do, for example. Look at the election last year, you see uh, dedicated, assiduous individuals working extremely hard to ensure that the expressed will of the, of the voters in the end got through. And these things are possible because of the fundamental liberal nature of the societies. So liberalism, and liberalism in this very general and uh, small L sense, in the sense of these rather vaguely specified concepts, proves itself very robust and, and very flexible. And it is, I think, owing to this outlook that in the last century, perhaps century and a half, maybe even two centuries, we've seen the development of possibilities for individual human lives and for better societies than existed for most of history at any rate, as a result of the practical application of these values. So I don't think we're being failed by, uh, by liberalism, small l, generally conceived liberalism. I think these fundamental structural uh, conceptions of autonomy, privacy, the rule of law, participation, the freedoms to uh, argue, to debate, to challenge, I think these things are constitutive of the framework of our societies and are protecting them. And they are very well worth continuing to protect. Uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Professor Grayling, for your speech.
Uh, we have a, a question uh, submitted anonymously um, that's come through a little bit late. Uh, it, it's for you, uh, Nick, but actually I, I think it could be equally applicable uh, for uh, Professor Grayling. So uh, if, if you wanted to come in afterwards, Professor Grayling, you're more than welcome to, but I will address this to Nick first of all. The question is, how do you think a new form of liberalism can take into account history and culture without looking for an objective truth? Uh, well, I think, first of all, um, uh, I very much enjoyed Professor Grayling's uh, um, speech and found myself wondering if we weren't on the same side of the of the debate, uh, because we're, I think, I think my argument, I think, is that is that we need to do what we can uh, to protect and preserve this sort of this core, this essential liberalism. But that there is a uh, there is an overreach which is caused by uh, a kind of um, overconfidence of both proponents of negative liberalism and uh, of negative liberty and and positive liberty, um, uh, how can we how can we preserve um, institutions? Is that what the, sorry was that the question? Institutions and uh, the question is how do you think a new form of liberalism can take into account history and culture without looking for an objective truth? Sorry, history and culture, not not institutions. I think they're absolutely fundamental to preserving the kind of uh, liberty and liberalism uh, that I'm talking about because um, because I think uh, the stories that we tell one another in a society, the traditions that we share in, uh, are ways in which. Uh, we recognise familiarity and strangers. Uh, you know, I may not know a particular person uh, I meet in a particular situation from a, a different part of the country, but I will soon recognise them as a fellow citizen of my country. And, and that familiarity in people is what builds trust and an expectation of reciprocity. Uh, and that is what allows uh, the sort of sense of solidarity uh, that we might want to have uh, in our society that then enables the things that most of us value in terms of uh, universal uh, public services, a welfare state, progressive taxation, uh, a willingness to make sacrifices in extreme times, whether that's us all locking ourselves in our homes during uh, a pandemic or even worse, a willingness to fight at a time of war. Uh, and I think the danger is that when you lose that sense of familiarity, uh, when you lose uh, the institutions and cultures and norms that make that familiarity possible, then society divides into two or more competing groups who all feel that they own their version of the truth. Uh, so actually, I don't think the, the two things in the question are necessarily opposed to one another. They're linked to one another. Uh, and it's the it's the norms and traditions of the society that make uh, actually the the pursuit of a common truth uh, and and commonly held beliefs uh, possible. Uh, Freddie, just very briefly in response to that, I really don't think we need a, a new form of liberalism. We need to um, recognise actually that. Uh, the core old paleoliberal values are ones that are bearing the load of sometimes very acerbic and, and difficult debates. I mean, Nick was talking there about interpretations uh, and applications of liberalism on left and right, identity politics on the one hand, um, stress on the market on the other hand. These debates can sometimes seem very divisive, um, but the, the overall liberal framework within which they occur allows them to occur, generally speaking, without massively disrupting uh, our societies and our relationships within those societies. So uh, we don't, uh, in my view, need a new form of liberalism. We just need to continue with and to continue valuing the one that we do have. I will say, however, one thing, which is that part of the argument uh, uh, that is had by people on different wings of liberalism, so to speak, certainly on different political wings, is about what the common good is. So it's not really a question of objective truth, it's about what we can share in the way of a, a common patch of ground where we can all meet and talk the same language and in the end come to some agreements about very fundamental things that matter to our society and which we don't want to see broken. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, both of you, for your response to that um, interesting question. Uh, we will now move on to our um, second speaker for the proposition, uh, who is our first student speaker of this evening, uh, Dan Timmons. Uh, Dan is a first year natural scientist um, at um, Fitzwilliam College. Uh, he won this uh, slot through open audition. Uh, Dan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Freddie. Um, I, I consider myself to be liberal, even though I'm on this side of the bait. Um, I think that the, the principle of individual freedom limited only by our need to respect the freedom of others uh, should be the guiding principle for our political lives. And as such, it, it saddens me to say that liberalism currently is in a state of crisis. Um, around the world, we've seen the rise of, of outspokenly illiberal politicians, uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary, Bolsonaro in Brazil. We have seen the Declaration of Human Rights and the United Nations lose prominence in debates of foreign policy. And, and it appears as if voters around the world just don't believe in liberal ideas anymore. And while many of today's anti-liberals don't seem to care at all about um, freedom of speech, women's rights, freedom of religion, suppression of church and state, and, and I don't agree with them in, in any way, nor do I sympathise with their calls. But that doesn't mean we don't have to understand um, their, their phenomenon, because I think these politicians didn't come out of the blue. And modern liberalism, I believe, is itself in large part responsible for their rise. I think in its current form, liberalism has a number of very important deep-rooted problems. And with that, I think it's fair to say that liberalism has failed us. And the primary problem, in my view, is not political correctness or anything like that. I think it's, it's um, the rather poor taste in friends uh, liberals have had over the years. Um, what I'm referring to here is the, the old standing alliance, the unfortunate alliance, I believe, between political liberalism and the economic system um, of capitalism. And, and allow me to explain, because we, we tend to think of capitalism in very simplistic terms. So we think of free citizens happily owning a little flower shop or working on a piece of privately owned land. And maybe, maybe to some extent, that may once have been an accurate version, a more localized, small scale economy around the time liberal ideas were first developed. And from that perspective, such an economic system could have been a very useful ally for the liberal against what was then the main opponents, um, the tyranny of the state in the form of uh, absolute monarchy, usually. However, I think the, the form of capitalism we see today is not the same as I just described it, and, and um, it's, it's really a different system. We, we now live in a global economy, one system that has provided enormous freedom to those with the ability to move capital around the world, where it best suits their interests, but hasn't the majority um, left behind, it's not part of that system, and often with no other choice than to take a job uh, at the local factory. And we, I think in its essential form, liberalism really does mean um, freedom. And because we've come to associate capitalism with liberalism, we've been led to believe over the years that capitalism in its modern form means freedom as well. And, and I think it's a mistake to think it. I think it's, it's not true. And in its current form, it has actually provided um, a unique way for a very small number of people to hold enormous power over the lives of their fellow citizens, in, in a way rivaled maybe only by the mechanisms of um, the state. We've seen the rise of monopolies or of oligopolies, such as that of big tech, and with it, the very small number of companies and a very small number of individuals holding um, enormous power over their fellow citizens. And take, for example, the, the taxi company, Uber, which is it's a company that never once in its entire existence has made a profit. Um, yet with ca enormous capital injections and, and underpaying the self-employed drivers, they're able to beat traditional taxi companies out of the market. And they're working towards establishing a monopoly in the taxi world. And that is not about the invisible hand at the free market allowing the best of companies to survive. That is really the, the power of money and of capital in our current economic system to um, influence and um, influence and control the lives and, um, of others. 
Similarly, Amazon can destroy local bookstores wherever it, it pops up. And a manufacturing company such as General Motors in the US can render a whole town without a job when it moves its factory to um, a low-income country with fewer workers' protection laws. Um, and I think that this is the core problem of liberalism today. It stood by and it watched as its friends turned into a foe and thereby undermining the very project of liberalism itself. Um, as I said at the start, individual freedom limited only by our need to protect and respect the freedom of others. And while applying this rule to the political side of life, I believe it's largely been ignored when it comes to the economy. And a choice between having to take an underpaid job in a sweatshop uh, or not being able to feed your children, I don't think that's freedom. And I would call that oppression. And similarly, to allow the concentration of power over our economy, over our lives, in the hand of such a small number of people is not liberal. And I think that this aspect of modern liberalism is in large part responsible for the increased opposition it's received in recent years. If you think about the US, a lot of people were initially drawn to former President Trump by his empty promises to bring back jobs that have been outsourced to faraway countries. Um, but of course, I think as most of us here know, these anti-liberals of today, they don't go about solving the problem and they much prefer to focus on, on scapegoats such as Mexicans or Antifa in the US or the, the very vaguely defined LGBT ideology that has now become more or less the official state enemy in Poland. Um, and in doing so, these anti-liberals are doing even more harm to our societies and bring us even further away from where we should be. So these politicians, their ideas, they will not and they cannot solve the problem. It's really up to liberals themselves to do um, just that. I think it's time for liberals to say their old friend goodbye, who's no longer true to them, and to work towards an economic system that can provide equal opportunity and with it freedom to everyone who um, participates. And the question, of course, is what should that system be? And well, I'm not entirely sure. It could be a social democratic system where democratically implemented laws limit the abilities of investors and companies to effectively restrict the freedom of others. And perhaps it might even be a democratic socialist system with, which is based more about mutual cooperation and joint control of the economy instead of our, our competition-based system we currently have. I'm not sure which, uh, what the best option is going to be, but, but luckily it's not up to me to decide what our economy looks like. Uh, I think these are the kind of discussions we should be having in years to come when we think about what kind of um, economy and what kind of society we want to live in. Because I truly believe that the um, political ideas of liberalism are uniquely in a position to create a society where everyone may be happy, precisely because it allows us to define the parameters of our own happiness. It allows us to choose for ourselves what makes us happy and follow our own paths. And, and that's really our goal. That's what we should keep in mind um, in going forward into the future. However, we, we cannot go about improving the system without acknowledging um, that it has a problem, without acknowledging that liberalism in its current form has indeed failed us. And, with that, I urge you all to vote in favour of this motion tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dan. Um, this bit of the motion, uh, this bit of the debate rather, uh, is uh, student versus student, uh, as we will move on to our second speaker for side uh, opposition, uh, Jacob Rose. Uh, Jacob is a third year uh, historian at Gonville and Keys College. He also won this slot uh, through open audition. Hello. So I have to apologise initially because it seems that there was a lot of very meticulously prepared speeches that were all very excellent. Um, but I'm going to start off responding to a couple of the comments first uh, before we really get into it. Um, and particularly this idea that I think is going to make me quite unpopular uh, and sort of alienate myself from a lot of the other people in the debate, which is that liberalism is misunderstood. And I think that a lot of the points raised by the proposition, especially these admissions that they are liberals, are incorrectly erecting a spectre of what liberalism is uh, to attack it. I'm not going to use the sort of famous term that we're all thinking on up to our tongues. 
Um, but there is a point to be made here that liberalism does create enemies. In fact, one of the things that Dan said in his speech just now was that liberalism is in a unique position to make everybody in society happy. Um, a lot of what my speech says sort of responds to, you know, my bullet points respond to what has been said, but this is categorically not true. And what I want to convince you of tonight, which is that liberalism does have enemies. It does have concrete ideals, but these are often misunderstood. This point that was raised is an excellent one of sort of neo-colonial global capitalist rivalries. That doesn't exclude a vision of liberalism, uh, nor does this idea that liberals have this sort of Hayek agenda. Uh, you know, we don't subscribe to the Pittite sort of secular religion of free trade in this absolute term, the free hand, you know, God's free hand in the economy, sort of providential view is not something that we share. Um, so without further ado, because a lot of what I've sort of already had written is quite responsive to what's said, I'm going to get on. Um, and there are three things that I want to convince you of. But overall, what I really want to convince you of is that liberalism is under attack. Uh, but it's often under attack for all the wrong reasons, and that far from failing us, its self-criticism, its deliberative powers, and its creative energies actually empower us. And I want you to keep an open mind of this vision of liberalism. And I'm going to draw particularly on someone that's already been mentioned, Isaiah Berlin, the great 20th century thinker, who rejected the pride of liberalism. He rejected the teleology. It's not absolute. It has to be fought for, and it's fragile. And so my first idea, I think the best way to introduce the idea that liberalism uh, is self-critical, is by looking at studies uh, of a period in history where liberals were in tremendous power, where liberalism was very popular in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And there's a work by historians by Matthew Thompson, Gillian Sutherland, David Wright, have shown how this sort of classical liberal social contract, something that Nick mentioned about the perfectibility of human life, a criticism that Patrick uh, Porter made as a professor in criticizing liberalism, is slightly misguided. And in days gone by, the liberal social contract was one where you required reason, education, civilization to perfect oneself. And this meant that we codified law codes in colonial India in an anglicized way. We denied civil rights to the Afrikaans in South Africa. It meant that people with physical and mental disabilities in England were relegated to second class citizenship. There are no liberals who believe this anymore. In fact, I would argue that if you look at thinkers, and not necessarily politicians, liberals are in the best place to be self-critical of liberalism. This is one of the start points that Isaiah Berlin goes after in his great work, The Crooked Timber of Humanity, which is a sort of, it, it pounces off a phrase by Kant, which is that from this crooked timber, nothing straight were ever made. And if that's true, if humanity is sort of innately cruel, cynical, self-interested, then it's the role of liberalism to erect structures of secularism, deliberative secularism, and perhaps even democracy. I don't for a minute believe that democracy and liberalism are intrinsic to one another. Um, but it rejects this idea that there are absolute dogmas. There are no absolute truths in politics or life. It requires deliberation. It requires toleration. But we don't pat ourselves on the back when we have elections. If you look at the 19th century with the Social Science Association, liberalism has always been deeply critical of itself, but it's always been associated with social science. We wouldn't look at America's elections and celebrate as liberals. We would look at the work by groups like the ACLU, the NAACP, who see that in America, in the South, in Georgia and Florida, there are felony voting restrictions which disenfranchise black voters. And so from this point of the deliberative power of liberalism, I want to sort of introduce my second idea that says, this motion is really quite silly. Liberalism is not at all what's failing us. Um, and again, returning to Berlin, I think this is essentially because liberalism is always in contention and it's in contention for what I think the essence of liberalism is, which is a conflict between, and this is something that Nick and Dan have touched on, a conflict between positive liberty, the freedom to act, and negative liberty, which is freedom from interference. And, um, you know, it, it's a privileged naivety to claim that uh, man is solely free to act and therefore in a free state. No, you know, this conflict has to be resolved on the ideas of the individual and of humanism. Uh, and that's why there is no intrinsic free market dogma in liberalism. Although we support free markets and free trade, uh, they're not absolute. Liberalism acknowledges that man has the right to accrue wealth, but man also has a right to live in dignity, free from economic oppression, which is why we grant the right to property essential to liberalism. But this fundamental right is not inalienable. Liberals will happily tax to raise benefits for society. Um, Liberalism is only individualist insofar that it empowers man within society and I think against the state. And this is exactly why liberalism is always going to have enemies, you know, and they're always going to be rich and they're always going to be powerful. 
if you look at China, and this is not a socialist comment, this is a, a comment about the interests of extreme dogmas on both sides. If you look at China with their triumphant COVID propaganda war or their treatment of the Uyghur Muslims, if you look at Donald Trump and his sort of elected and unelected mobs or his spree of executions in the last six months in office, if you look at the suspension of citizen rights in Kashmir, if you look at Bolsonaro in Brazil, if you look at all of these things as a failure of liberalism, you are utterly missing the point. These are rallying calls to defend liberalism. It shows the fragility of liberalism. It shows the fragility of concepts like toleration, deliberation and liberal democracy that require tentative care. There's a great quote by the late US Justice Hand, who sort of bastardizes a phrase by Lord Acton in England, which is that absolute uh, power is delightful, but absolute power is absolutely delightful. And I think from this phrase, we can see that liberalism is always going to have enemies. This doesn't mean that liberalism is intransigent, by the way, or fearful of action, and it's not inherently democratic or populist at all. Uh, in the 19th century, we repealed the Corn Laws as liberals in the face of overwhelming opposition from the landed interest in Parliament. And in the 20th century, in an era of tremendous uh, universal franchise, uh, the death penalty was abolished by uh, you know, a, a private member's bill through thoroughly liberal propositions in the face of overwhelming opposition from the public. And so from this vantage point where we can see that liberalism is deliberative and self-critical, I want to now begin to look at some of the tremendous successes of liberalism that build on this process and this tradition. This tradition, which is in essence liberality, which is to be critical of government, I think. Um, the means by which we make our decision tonight, by the way, are a testament to the values and successes of liberalism. There is somewhere an incredible irony in a former Conservative Party advisor uh, and a politics lecturer freely and openly telling us that liberalism has failed us. Um, and you're going to have to forgive me for my use of the F word, which has already been brought up by Nick, but Foucault would want us to denaturalize the political and social world. So I think we should do a bit of that. And that's to say, we didn't always reject the divine right of kings. We didn't always reject the divine right of the church. We didn't always believe that it was evil for a husband to be able to rape his wife without legal impunity. We didn't always believe that those without property or those without, uh, of a certain religion or race should sit in our halls of government. And there wasn't always a worldwide human rights charter. The sort of movements in the 17th century of legal political collaboration culminate in 1948 in this document. And the sort of the universal absolutism of this document, which says that all the rights of this charter apply to every human by virtue of their humanity, is an incredibly radical idea in the history of ideas. And are all these charters observed? No, of course they're not. But they have formed the cornerstone of many post-war constitutions uh, and human rights charters. And for every Xi Jinping that gets away with genocide, there is a Radovan Karadzic who is dragged in front of the International Criminal Court by the Serbian people who want to move towards uh, you know, European integration and democratic elections. With tremendous setbacks, there has been a global movement towards the abolition of degrading punishment, torture and executions. And this much, the proposition absolutely cannot deny or refute. The evidence is overwhelming by organizations like Reprieve or the Death Penalty Information Project that globally states are moving toward a position where they deny themselves the power of life and death over the citizen. And in states where they still abuse this power, it is being reported on by an increasingly freer press around the globe. Another great sort of facet of liberalism, if you will. And so sort of drawing things to a close, because I've been talking for a while, people are always going to deride liberalism. On one side, there are the arguments that it doesn't create a, a government of workers or trade unions or the people. And on the other side, there is this peculiar language of unelected judges or liberal technocrats, often used by people who accept that there is no intrinsic link between liberalism and democracy, but use that as a framework by which to attack our deliberations in democracy. Um, liberalism isn't failing us, as I think I've quite conclusively shown, and it absolutely isn't in its death throes. It may be in a crisis, but this is just meaning that we have to defend it even more. As man around the world empowers himself more, liberalism becomes more and more imperative and in need of defenders. And so what I'm saying at this end point in the debate is that while liberalism's enemies have been consigned to the dustbin of history, here we are ever more debating the future of liberalism. It's faced these sorts of enemies it faces before and it will face them again. And it just means we have to defend it and reaffirm it. And I think as a sort of concluding statement uh, today, when a leading opposition uh, a opposer to Hezbollah was shot in Beirut, uh, or a string of judges have been killed, many of them female, in Afghanistan by the Taliban the last few weeks. And it was revealed yesterday that three and a half million Uyghurs are 
open to serious sexual exploitation and rape at the hands of CCP men. It seems awfully naive in this privileged position to be sitting here and debating, has liberalism failed us? I think that's all I've got to say on the matter. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jacob, for your speech. Uh, we have a question uh, for the opposition, which wasn't originally directed for you, but I might actually raise it if, if I can. The question is, have liberal ideas been problematic in the context of pandemics when governments have had to make difficult com compromises on civil liberties? Or have they helpfully pointed out what, should, what the limits should be to government interventions on the lives of citizens? Is, is that to me? Right, okay. Um, well, that's an interesting one. I mean, in a sort of historical sense, pandemics are give or take red herrings, and I'm going to be short in this answer because I don't want to drag on. But in a historical perspective, this isn't the first time that liberal, you know, quote unquote, comparatively liberal states have faced a pandemic issue. You know, parliaments in the 17th century and even in the 18th century issued what they called plague orders, limiting sort of trade internationally coming up the Thames in London. Uh, and you know, a great fact at the end of the 17th century, one quarter of the inhabitants of Worcestershire were in jail because they had disobeyed local magistrate pandemic orders. But there is obviously a crippling failing that we're seeing here. And I'm not nearly clever enough to say if that's behavioral, if that's an issue of culture in the West, or if that's an issue with our liberal democracy. Because, you know, I don't want to be accused of comparing apples and oranges. But there are liberal democracies on the planet which have done incredibly well at quelling this pandemic. New Zealand is one, but there is the claim that their geography is different. Well, then the argument in Australia is that their geography is much the same and they have very similar political structures and values, a free press, criticism. Um, but I also don't want to accuse the British people in some sort of anti-conservative, anti-traditionalist stance of disobeying the orders because we're culturally disobedient. But I will say that, you know, it's 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 a many feathered bird. If you wish for sort of more authoritarian practices to quell a pandemic, you might want to look what happens in those authoritarian countries when there isn't a pandemic. I mean, there are still three times as many people that have died globally interned in concentration camps in northern China. And then, yeah. Thank you, uh, Jacob. Uh, right, we shall now move on to our uh, final speaker for the uh, proposition. Uh, the final speaker is Dr. Jeannie Moorfield. Uh, Jeannie is a senior lecturer in political theory at the University of Birmingham and is currently a fellow in the Quincy Institute. She is the author of two books, Empires Without Imperialism, Anglo-American Decline and the Politics of Deflection, and Covenants Without Swords, Idealists, Liberalism and the Spirit of Empire. Jeannie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Freddie. Um, <clears throat> so I, uh, I am here to speak for the proposition, um, but I want to begin by calling into question the existence of a coherent political project called liberalism. If there is one constant across the century and a half that people, states, and empires have been calling themselves liberal, it's inconsistency. Inconsistency caused by the ongoing tension between things that self-described liberals say that they want. So equality and unlimited accumulation, free trade, imperial control of markets and resources. The history of liberalism is thus replete with examples of peoples, states, and empires who call themselves liberal, who sometimes advance all kinds of principles that I can totally support as a democratic socialist. Human rights, democracy, freedom of speech, the recognition that we live in multicultural, multiracial societies. That same history is also replete with examples of people, states, and empires who call themselves liberals, advancing principles that rationalize mass violence, exacerbate economic inequality, destabilize democracy, and lead to increasingly punitive immigration regimes. My point is that substantively, all we can know about liberalism is what people who call themselves liberals have done in its name. Again, however, I'm here to argue for the proposition that liberalism has failed us because I agree with this house's assessment that quote, liberalism has provided the hegemonic framework for understanding politics since the end of the second world war. So the question is, how can liberalism both be fungible, expressed by different people in different times to mean different things, and still be the hegemonic political idiom of our age. 
In order to answer that question, it's important to approach liberalism not as a political project that one is either for or against, but rather as a hegemonic narrative about identity, about who we are. And this is what Michael Ignatieff, interestingly paraphrasing Isaiah Berlin, calls liberalism as a fighting creed. A fighting creed that is also connected to the most powerful nations and empires in history. So we need to stop talking about what liberalism the political project is and start interrogating what liberalism the hegemonic fighting creed does. And what it does is deflect attention away from alternatives to the status quo and from its own contradictions. So how does that deflection work? Well, by way of example, let's take what's called the American-led liberal world order. Supporters of the liberal world order argue that after World War II, Western liberal states agreed to submit themselves to the hegemonic leadership of the United States. They created what John Eikenberry calls a, quote, Western-oriented liberal international system organized around liberal ideas like openness, the rule of law, human rights, free trade, and multilateral cooperation. So eventually, the story goes, this order was open to non-Western states and has worked to preserve the peace ever since. Except, of course, that it hasn't. Those liberal democracies that entered into alliance after the war weren't just self-contained states with no histories. They were empires who, despite their vaunted language about cooperation and democratic sovereignty, fought tooth and nail to prevent decolonization preserve unlimited access to natural resources, and enforce open, open door trade policies on the global south. So in 1960, when members of the United Nations brought the Declaration on the Granting of Independence to col colonial countries and people to the floor for a vote, it was opposed by the most powerful liberal democracies in the world, the US, the UK, France, and several other liberal democratic states. When they couldn't stop decolonization and the nationalization of natural resources by legal means, America and its liberal allies shifted tactics, working to overthrow and destabilize the elected governments of over 50 countries through coups, assassinations, the use of chemical weapons, invasion, war, bombings, ultimately leading to the death, disappearance, and torture of millions of people throughout the post-war period. By the 1970s, many of these liberal democracies joined together to shut down implementation of the new international economic order, a still very liberal approach to global economics aimed at mitigating the trade imbalances caused by hundreds of years of colonialism. Instead, they ushered in an era of World Bank-inspired structural adjustments, then accelerating inequality on a global scale. But, okay, so here's the thing. When you ask a supporter of the liberal world order, hey, how do you account for the fact that so much violence, inequality, and illiberalism has been committed in the name of liberalism? They inevitably deflect. And that deflection takes on a variety of different forms. Sometimes it's just a literal sleight of hand. Don't look over there, look over here. Don't look at that drone strike, look here at this human rights convention. Sometimes deflection involves backhanded acknowledgement, yes, Overthrowing other people's elected governments is unfortunate, but in the grand scheme of things, the world is better because of liberals. As Eikenberry puts it, despite imperialism, slavery, and racism, to the extent that the long arc of history does bend toward justice, it does so thanks to the activism and moral commitment of liberals and their allies. Another common deflective tactic is to say, okay, yes, bad things happen, but they can't stick to us because we're not that. As Joe Biden put it on January 6th, in the middle of the Capitol insurrection, that's not who we are. In 2019, in a speech on Brexit, John Major similarly noted that division and hate is, quote, emphatically not who we are as a people. But the deflective gesture that really shuts down dialogue also makes an appearance in your description of this debate. Quote, if not liberalism, then what? which liberals will often frame as, if not us, then who? If not the liberal world order, what do you want? Russia? China? If not the mainstream Democratic Party, then who? Crazy Bernie? Racist Trump? 
Corbyn, Farage, always conflated. If not the EU economics and neoliberal globalization as currently configured, and if not the American-led liberal world order with its trillion dollar a year security budget, what is there but chaos and the worst excesses of the right and the left? That narrowing of options, that is liberal hegemony. It is deflection all the way down. And the problem with deflection is that it makes it impossible to do several things. It makes it impossible to have a reasoned discussion about the complicity of liberals in not just some of the worst atrocities of the 20th and 21st centuries, but in laying the political groundwork for the far right backlash in this country and in mine. Calling Brexiteers both imperial nostalgists and anti-globalists, for instance, erases the fact that the British Empire was not only the first truly global economic system, it was a liberal project championed by self-described liberals. Muting the liberal imperial history makes it seem like critiques of the EU and global capitalism arise out of nowhere. They can only be understood as either Luddite communism or a bizarre desire for little England as imperial greatness. Likewise, erasing the overt and covert intervention of the US and its liberal allies in the Middle East from our collective memories makes it impossible to talk about the context that gives rise to terrorist violence without being accused of victim blaming. In other words, liberal deflection makes it impossible to make reasoned connections between history and political reality. It thus creates the very conditions for the post-factual world that facilitated Brexit and Trumpism in the first place. Professor Grayling has said that the problem today, and this is elsewhere, is that populations in liberal democracies have gotten lazy and they're not thinking critically. But what if the actual problem is that liberal bromides and fighting creeds and narratives about who we are actively contribute to an environment where critical thinking is impossible? Finally, the if not us then who response vitiates the possibility of simply approaching liberalism for what it is, a hodgepodge of some really good and some really terrible ideas. For deflective liberals, we either have to accept the whole ideological identity package or we're beyond the pale. We're China, we're Trump, we're Russia, we're Boris, we're Brexit, we're Farage. It makes it impossible for people across the ideological spectrum to identify points of overlap fruitful contestation, and even solidarity. It makes it impossible to identify political alternatives bubbling up from non-liberal global locations, such as the World Social Forum. It makes it impossible to see the world differently. So here is my plea to liberals. Your deflection has failed us. Stop staring in the mirror. Stop sucking up all the oxygen in the room. Start taking responsibility. Start listening to people. Accept that there are more things in heaven and earth than dreamt of in your fighting creed. And to everybody, and particularly people of your generation, Cambridge Union, we don't have to let liberal nostrums and finger wagging limit the horizons of our politics. We can accept the liberal ideas that we like, and we can reject the ones that we don't. We can demand accountability and reflection, we can sow solidarity within, across, and beyond the liberal universe, because all of us deserve better. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jeannie, for your speech. Um, we do have an anonymous uh, question for you, which I think is uh, um, uh, pointed at your at, at your point, your 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 reference to the last uh, "if not liberalism, then what?" Um, question. Um, the, the 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 anonymous um, submitter ha has asked if you could elucidate uh, what that "what" might be. If you might take bits of liberalism, uh, rejecting bits of it. If you ignore the deflection, um, can you envisage uh, an alternative world order? I mean, an alter, I can, I can I envision alternative forms of cosmopolitanism. I can envision alternative forms of global organization. I can envision all sorts of alternative forms of, of, of solidarity and political discussion. 
um, these things are actually existing. They're being talked about in all kinds of different corners. They're coming out in the writing that people are doing on alternative forms of cosmopolitanism that we find in anti-colonial thought that people are coming to through their activism. So I think it just is about listening. My goal as a political theorist and someone who writes about foreign policy is to get us to stop getting frozen in this moment where the fear of what else keeps us from asking deeper questions about the limitations of liberalism itself. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, right, we will move on to our final speaker uh, for the opposition and our final speaker uh, for this evening. Uh, the final speaker is Bill Emmett. Uh, Bill is a British journalist who was the editor in chief of The Economist from 1993 until 2006. He is the author of some 14 books and uh, chairs a number of organizations, including the charity uh, Wake Up Foundation, the International Institute for Strategic Studies, uh, and the Japan S Society of UK. Um, Bill, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, and thank you um, very much um, for inviting me to take part in this uh, debate. Um, I am uh, speaking, of course, against the motion. I would like to uh, begin by suggesting that um, the five previous speakers have also produced um, excellent speeches all against the motion. Um, we are really united in all sorts of ways um, uh, among the five of us uh, in either thinking that, as it were, the typical meaning of the word liberalism is devoid of content, um, or um, thinking that actually, if it's failed us in, any, in a specific way, what all we want to do is in a liberal way to make it better, or to improve it, or to take things from it. I think that we are actually in remarkable amount of, uh, of agreement. Let me say that I think that um, what the previous speaker said uh, about liberalism being a hodgepodge is it absolutely to the point. It isn't a coherent philosophy. It's, a, it's an attitude of mind. It's an approach that has, over its lifetime, taken many, many different forms, some of them hypocritical, some of them of one connected together with various other ideological aims, it's an extremely varied idea. And we can illustrate that just by looking around the world today. Has liberalism failed when 23 of the 25 countries of the world with the highest living standards are all what we would describe as liberal? In other words, the only two that are not in that highest living standard to top 25 are oil, state, oil and gas states that have no population. Qatar and the United Arab Emirates. All the rest are liberal in some way. Japan, we should see as liberal in the same way as the United Kingdom. Finland, in the same way as Canada. But they are quite different in all sorts of aspects. They have different mixes uh, between um, uh, the state and the market, different rainbow, different positions on the rainbow spectrum of capitalism. They have different approaches to immigration. They have different thoughts about, um, about identity. They have actually quite a wide variety of different uh, laws and principles about some of the things that uh, many of us may consider um, in our senses essential about uh, whether it's uh, particular human rights, issues about the death penalty and other things pacifism or interventionism in international affairs. These are incredibly varied countries, but do we dare call any of them not liberal? I suggest that we cannot. Or if we do not, then we have, we have lost the ability to as it were, connect uh, ourselves together. Second point I would say about the idea that liberalism, something unique in the current time tells us that this thing we are, this hodgepodge we are calling liberalism has failed us in inverted commas. Thinking just of Britain now, if I go back through my adult life, let's say back from when I was a teenager and coming up towards going to university, unfortunately in the other place, I think of how many failed times one could come up with for liberalism. The three day week, when I was doing my homework by candlelight. Um, the uh, IMF rescue in 1976, 
the oil shock that then led to hyperinflation at that same time, the winter of discontent at the end of the decade when bodies were not being buried and rubbish not cleared from the streets because of strikes, the mass unemployment in the early period of Margaret Thatcher, the coal strikes, the bitter divisions in this country, the Falklands War that where our foreign policy um, uh, and so forth uh, and uh, colonial heritage led to conflict um, and, uh, and um, in many ways divided us even from some of our closest allies. And then we can go through into the Iraq War, of course, and into 2008. Liberalism is always failing us if by what we mean is that there are certain aspects of today's life and society that we're discontented with. But that's the point. Liberalism is not uh, a coherent uh, set of plans, not actually a mission towards a perfect society, not a, as it were, a, a, a ship with a navigation scheme to get to a particular place. It's a process. Liberal countries have many forms. Liberal countries have many failings. They make many mistakes. They commit many sins. They are often highly inconsistent. But that doesn't seem to me to mean that liberalism as such has failed, because after all, what is what do we mean when we debate liberalism this evening? I think we mean something, and the philosophers among us, uh, both uh, Nick Timothy and Anthony Grayling, have done a much better job than I can at analyzing that. But I would say that to me, liberalism is an essentially humble philosophy. It's a philosophy that says that we are not omniscient. It's a, it's a philosophy that should say, we do not know how to direct the economy to a specific aim. It's a philosophy that, say, that should say, we do not know how to direct other countries in a particular way. It's a way of managing change, a way of managing disputes, but above all, a way of correcting our own errors. And by God, we make a lot of errors. By God, the flaws in our own systems and our own thinking, our own hypocrisies keep bubbling up. But what would we do if we didn't have a liberal system to try to prevent those errors from overcoming us as they might have done on January the 6th at the Capitol in Washington? So what I want to say to you finally, because we're running late and running out of time, is that liberalism, at least properly thought through and thought through in a humble way, Liberalism is not the problem. Liberalism is the solution. Liberalism is our way of correcting our errors. And without it, we will fail. I invite you all to vote against the motion. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bill, for closing um, our debate this evening. Uh, thank you again to all our speakers for six uh, excellent speeches uh, and to everyone who participated uh, using our form below by asking some interesting questions. Um, you can join us uh, tomorrow for uh, Andre Asiman's interview. Uh, Andre Asiman is the author of Call Me By Your Name. Uh, that'll be at seven o'clock tomorrow. Uh, and then we have an event uh, at the weekend, um, I believe on... Uh, Yes, Saturday it is. We have a 50-50 Parliament event uh, where we'll be uh, discussing um, gender structures in the Houses of uh, Commons and the House of Lords. Uh, and then on Monday we have a, a collaborative event on um, the uh, refugee crisis in historical perspective, and that's with the uh, Laslett Society. Uh, and then back on Thursday for our uh, usual Thursday night debate, we will be debating uh, the motion, This House Regrets the Fall of Rome, uh, and that's again at eight o'clock. Um, so that's just a reminder of what you can have uh, look forward to in, in the next uh, week or so. Um, I wish uh, everyone uh, a very good evening. Uh, thank you very much for listening um, and good night. <laughs>